Hi everybody, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Carrie Smith and on behalf of Chemos Networks, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar about configuration and routing of CLOS networks. Presenting today will be Dinesh Dutt. Dinesh Dutt. Dinesh is our Chief Scientist here at Chemos Networks and has been involved in the networking industry for the past 15 years. He's been involved in enterprise and data center networking technologies, including the design of many of the ASICs that powered Cisco's mega switches, such as the CAT6000 and the Nexus family of switches. He also has experience in storage networking from his days at Andiamo Systems and in the design of FCOE. He's the co-author of Trill, VXLON, and has filed over 40 patents. The webinar will be about 30 to 45 minutes, and we'll take short stops periodically to answer any questions you may have. For those of you interested, you have the opportunity to ask Dinesh questions during the webinar by using the window marked questions. Simply type in your questions, click send, and we'll do our best to answer the questions during the webinar. You can also tweet us your questions, and our Twitter handle is at Cumulus Networks. And with that, I'd like to turn this over to Dinesh. But before I do that, I want to open up a poll. Um, and uh, on a scale of 1 to 5, can you let us know what your comfort level is with um, routing configuration? So you can go ahead and um, you can go ahead and, and uh, Vote now. And we'll give you guys about maybe five more seconds, and we'll go ahead and get started. And we're going to close this in five, four, three, two, and one. All right, Dinesh, here we go. Uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, thank you for attending the webinar. Uh, I hope to make this interesting uh, enough for people who are familiar with the subject as well as people who are newbies uh, to see how we can look at the modern data center networking and how we can get all more comfortable with it. This talk is made possible by Cumulus Networks, where I work, uh, where uh, these are the adventures of the rocket turtle going boldly where uh, no network has gone before. Sorry, just okay. So uh, one of the key transformations that is going on right now that we took, covered in the first part of the presentation is the core aggress, uh, ag access and aggregation model has been changed to a leap spine model. And one of the key transformations in that is the switch from L2 to L3. And what I hope to show in this is that when you make this transformation, life is only going to get easier from the management of networks rather than more difficult. For a lot of people, as the old uh, joke goes, will, I, will it hurt when I pee? No, it will not. And that's what I hope to show in this uh, presentation. So what are the simplifications that are brought by L3? First of all, there are fewer protocols to configure. Unlike L2, which many people think it's simple, there are actually a lot of L2 protocols to configure. Uh, things like STP, which variation of STP, and what about uh, GVRP, what about GMR, MVRP, M, uh, then what about FHRP, do I run HSRP, do I run VRRP? There are tons of protocols that you don't have to worry about the moment you switch to L3. And all of those protocols are standard interoperable protocols, meaning you have multi-vendor support for it, so you are not locked into many vendors when you do many of the functionality. There are also, that means fewer protocols to configure, means fewer protocols to troubleshoot, which means that from an OPEX perspective, this is going to be far more interesting and easy for you. And yay, you can trace route across your network. If you had a layer two network, how would you trace route across the layer two boxes in between? There is no real mechanism. But with layer three, you can trace route across your network. So with that said, I will hope to go through a quick routing intro. I realize there may be people here who are already very familiar with routing and who are uh, wanting to talk to me about route maps. Uh, please uh, hold on. We will go over that uh, in a few uh, minutes. Uh, we'll talk about following that, we'll talk about route configuration and automation with respect to how, what are the key aspects of routing configuration and how, what, are it, what is it that the layer 3 networks 
in the modern data center allows you to do with respect to being able to make it more automatable. We'll then get into PTM and how PTM simplifies things even further, and we'll end with the possibilities to come. I hope at the end of this presentation, people are leave with a couple of messages. The first message I would like them to leave with is, L3 is not hard. L3 is actually quite simple. The second message I would like you to leave with is when I look at a routing configuration, I know what this configuration implies and I can easily understand it as opposed to feel that this routing configuration is something that's to be terrified about because people have said layer three is hard. I don't think layer three is hard. The final part that I would like to hope people will remember is that with PTM and with some of the simplifications that are being talked about, things can only get easier, not more difficult. So with that said, let's get into the, uh, the, next, uh, the actual subject matter. Um, really quick, we have one more question. Are you looking to implement DevOps? And if you can go ahead and um, submit your answers, we'll give you about quick five more seconds. And five, four, three, two, and one. So, you know, it's funny, the world has changed so much. I mentioned this in my last presentation as well. A few years ago, if you mentioned a router, what you see in the picture is what people thought about. But today, people think about it differently, just the way people think about it differently when you say, I plan to surf. So let's review very quickly a few key points between routing and bridging. Routing is based on looking up the IP address, not the MAC address, fundamentally. And you get loop fee protection, not just in the control plane, which is what you get with layer two, which is its spanning tree, but in the IP networks, in a layer three network, you also get it in the data plane through the means of something called a TTL field. The routing protocol by default assumes that a peer is down and not reachable if it does not hear from it. Unlike bridging, where spanning tree says, hey, I can't hear from you, you must be a host, so I'm gonna send you all my packets. And when there is a problem, what ends up happening is network meltdown, which is why spanning tree is so universally loved. The other aspect of this is routing protocols can work with simple and sophisticated use cases. If you are a small shop and you're saying like, hey, all I have are five racks of switches uh, or five racks and why do I need to worry about routing? Is it going to make my life harder? Actually not. It can be quite simple as I hope to show in this presentation. But if you are a 10,000 rack mega scale customer, then routing works for you too. You want to do sophisticated things like WIP announcement, you can do that. You can do route maps. But so the point is routing protocols can be simple as well as sophisticated. It's up to you as the customer to determine what it is that you want to be able to do. So with that, I want to quickly highlight a few points. What are the basic parts to configuring a routing protocol? There are actually just three basic parts. When you look at a routing configuration, there isn't a lot of complexity. There are some fairly simple things in a routing protocol. The three basic parts are, who do I communicate with? And what do I tell them? And then there is the fine tuning of the conversation, which is various protocol specific knobs, timers, so I can speak a little faster, I can speak a little slower. I'm sure many of them have been told many times that I need a tuner that can make me speak a little slower. But uh, in any case, but first and most importantly, you need who am I? And let's see what this means with respect to someone who's coming from a layer two world going into a layer three world. On your left is a spanning tree configuration. It's a very simple spanning tree configuration. And on the right is a routing configuration. And somebody who looks at the left and the right says, oh my God, I see more lines. But actually there are two different pieces of configuration on the right side. There's an OSPF configuration and there's a BGP configuration. If you look at the color coding, who am I? That is essentially the router ID. What do I tell them is essentially what you are communicating. In case of uh, BGP, it is essentially neighbors and you're redistributing a connected route. In case of OSPF, you're telling them your link state, which is associated with interface SWP1 and SWP2. And then there are fine points of conversation, such as the IP OSPF area, uh, the router BGP line, etc. 
If you look on the left side, the spanning tree configuration is all about fine points of conversation. You don't have to say who you are. You don't have to know who you're talking to, and there's nothing to tell them. Because it's only control plane, there is no communication. Everything else is happening in the data plane through the learning mechanism. And because there is no data plane protection, loops can happen much more easily. But if you think about it and you say that these are the four pieces I remember, who am I, what do I, who do I talk to, and what do I tell them, I think you can understand routing configuration pretty quickly and not really have to break your head over that. And uh, I hope to make that point clear as we look at real configurations and real networks. Do people have any questions at this point uh, before I continue? Let's see, I think that we are okay in the questions. If you have any questions, feel free to reach um, us by um, answering a question in the window marked questions. Actually, we have one quote coming in. Um, L2 is also used for isolation. Which is easier compared to ACLs everywhere? So the question that is asked is, you know, L2 is also a very nice way of isolating. Isn't it simpler to use L2 versus using ACLs? And there is some truth to that. L2, the question of VLANs provides you a very easy group isolation mechanism. In, a, in case of la layer 3, it's a little more complicated. But when you think about it, if all you want to do is prevent people from reaching certain subnets, you can just completely avoid advertising those subnets to them. If you're trying to do something much more fine-grained, such as control who Dinesh can talk to or which people are on this webinar, then the VLANs are simpler. And you'd use something like a network virtualization to provide a layer two service to provide you that mechanism of being able to say who are the people in a group. So the question is certainly uh, true. And I get another question, L2 is lighter. That's a loaded statement. Yes, it is lighter, hence you get loops is one way you can talk about it. Yes, it is lighter from the perspective of configuration. I would recommend you to take a look at a layer two configuration on an aggregation box and tell me that's actually any simpler than what I'll be showing you in the next few slides. So with that said, let's go look at what it means to configure class networks. We talked about this in the previous webinar. We, I'm showing you a three-tier class where you've got an intercluster spine, you've got what are called clusters or pods, and the clusters or pods are interconnected through the intercluster spine. For the sake of this presentation, I'll simplify that three-tier into this picture on the right here where you've got uh, essentially top of racks, T1 and T2, which represent the ones that are connected to the servers. You have the mid-level spine, which are the spines within a particular pod or a cluster, and these mid-level spines, M1 through M4, allow communication within a pod. And then there are the top-level spines which allow communication across the pods. I'll be using this topology for the rest of the presentation. So one of the things is that there are two kinds of protocols. I skipped over that. There are what are called link state protocols, and there is what is called a distance vector protocol. Link state protocol example is OSPF. That's a very popular link state protocol. It's very commonly used in enterprises. The other fairly popular link state protocol is ISIS. The primary point about a link state protocol is that the idea of a link state protocol is it's trying to tell the world about who its neighbors are and what its neighbors are telling it. More precisely put, what it is doing is Whenever Dinesh says, for example, Carrie is in the room with me, Carrie tells me, hey, Dinesh, I heard this from, the, from one of the questions. I do not interpret it when I attempt to tell somebody else what Carrie said. I give them the envelope which contains exactly what Carrie said so that I'm not modifying it. The benefit of this is that link state protocols can be very, very accurate in terms of knowing what everybody is speaking. That also comes with state complexity and explosion and it, it, some amount of chattiness, but that is what it is good for. And it is pretty popular, and it is used from what I know of from very small networks to very large-scale networks. And what OSPF does in order to reduce the chattiness and to reduce the explosion, and every link state protocol does something similar, is it re defines neighborhoods. So it's essentially like communities. Within a community, you can chat 
everything you say and everything you say will be precisely represented to everybody else in the community. The moment you leave the community, there is going to be some amount of summarization or some amount of, hey, here is what you need to know being done by the border routers or the guys who control the perimeter of the neighborhoods. So in this example, for ex when people build large layered uh, class networks, people say M1 and M2 are the border routers, T1 and T2 are the members of the community. Similarly, in the other pod, M3 and M4 are the border routers, and T3 and T4 are the community members. So everything within each of those pods is very well represented and accurately represented. So T3 knows precisely what T4 said, and it knows precisely what M4 said but T3 does not know very precisely what T1 or T2 said. That's a very simple example of a link state protocol. If you map it into a configuration, you will see that essentially you have what is the backbone, the intercluster area is called, uh, OSPF supports two level uh, of neighborhoods. It's got a hierarchy of neighborhoods it's, and supports only a two level hierarchy. There is everything that is the pod, and there is everything that interconnects the pod. When you look at the configuration over here, essentially you see the router ID is telling you who it is, and then everything that follows is essentially a specification of what are you telling and who are you telling it to. So interface, if you take an example, interface SWP3, it's one of the routed interfaces, and you say what area it belongs to. And network point to point is just a simplification to reduce some chattiness in the protocol at the initial startup time. But the point is, even though this looks like a lot of configuration, you see it looks pretty identical. What's in SWP1 and what's in SWP2 is very similar. Similarly, what's in SWP3 and what's in SWP4 is very similar. So the protocol configuration is actually fairly trivial once you understand and ask the basic questions. Who am I? It's the router ID. Who am I talking to? It's the interfaces that you're defined to. You're speaking to whoever is at the other end of the interface. And what are you telling them? You're telling them about your interface state and what IP addresses you have, et cetera. BGP is the other protocol, and it belongs to the second class of protocols, routing protocols, what is called a distance vector protocol. Unlike OSPF, what BGP does is it summarizes the information always and tells its neighbors what it knows about the world. So at any given time, you don't know what really your neighbor is aware of. All you know is what your neighbor is telling you. And based on that, you have to assume that your neighbor is accurate. If your neighbor is misguided, then you could end up with wrong information and you have to figure out ways to make sure that you don't pick up misguided information. And it's not misguided because they're being malicious, that's just the nature of the distance vector game. BGP and all the modern distance vector protocols know how to handle that, and there are mechanisms around it, but that's just the nature of the beast. BGP powers the internet, by the way, so this is not something that you shrug lightly, and it's a Swiss Army knife of routing. Not only when you say, okay, what do, what do I, who am I? There is a classic router ID, and what do I tell them? BGP can tell you IP address prefixes, or it can be configured to send you the recipe for chicken a la king. I mean, BGP pretty much does everything. So it's a Swiss Army knife. It's pretty powerful, even though it's a very simple protocol in the actual understanding and the implementation of it, compared to a link state protocol, BGP is actually pretty simple. BGP gets a lot of, uh, how shall I say, bad rap at times because its configuration can be pretty hairy. BGP began in the service provider world, so a lot of people think oh, you know, BGP is very hard for me. The last time I looked at a BGP configuration, there were so many things in there that I did not understand. That is true if you want to, remember I said, routing protocols can grow with your sophistication. It can actually be kept pretty simple, and I'll show that in the next few slides. The other nice thing about BGP is it supports multi-protocols, which means if you are running IPv4 and IPv6, then it's very straightforward to go over how many v4 and v6 prefix, uh, you can have the same protocol and communicate everything over v4 and v6. If it's OSPF, it's v2 and v3, you'll have to have separate instances of protocol, which means essentially you're running two instances of protocol which are acting like ships in the night. 
And also, when BGP is used within the data center, it's an adaptation that has been made. BGP originated in the service providers, and as I said, it powers the internet. When you run it inside the data center, which can be pretty large, it is run in the absence of any other routing protocol. In the service provider world, BGP is typically run with OSPF or ISIS, some other what is called an IGP protocol. In the data center, it is used without any of them. I see a question pop up, which is, what's the number of prefixes supported in Cumulus BGP? That sounds like a very product specific question. I'll defer that to a later time. So if you look at the BGP configuration here again, it's fairly simple. It's the previous one that we have. And this is a topology that can be defined, that, that has been defined based on the draft that uh, Petr Lapukov, who used to be at Microsoft, uh, wrote about how you configure BGP in the data center. Essentially, it assumes the following. If you look at this again and you walk the three pieces, which is who am I? That's the BGP router ID right there. And who do I talk to? That's the neighbor statements. So the neighbor and remote AS statements are the ones that tell you who you're talking to. And activate is essentially a mechanism of saying, yes, I want you to start sending packets uh, information to them. And BGP being a distance vector protocol, unlike a link state protocol, it cannot do things like ECMP by default, but BGP has been modified to do that, and other distance vector protocols do it as well. EIGRP especially is a very popular or a well-understood protocol and a well-respected protocol that can do many of these things. So BGP can do multipathing as well when you use it in the data center, as we said, within the data center, especially in the cloth fabric, ECMP is very uh, useful. So you can do multipathing here. So as you look at this topology again, you see two pieces. It's a repeat. Things are just repeated over and over again. You only have who am I talking to, who am I talking to, and what do I tell them? So it's a very repeatable, simple configuration that can work for many people if your networks are not very large. So I have a question that's come up, which is BGP this is designed as an exterior gateway protocol, meaning it's supposed to communicate that powers the internet. How do you use it within the data center? Within the data center, the, the discussion of that is actually going to be pretty long. There is a draft that's written up called Draft Lapukov. Uh, if you just look for Draft Lapukov BGP data center routing, you will find that draft. And that goes into a fair amount of detail uh, to your heart's content. We can go over that. This webinar is a little more of an overview, so I can't go over that. But the primary points that I can say from the protocol is essentially everything is presented as an up-down. BGP is turned into an up-down protocol, which means that T1 will send a packet to M1, which will send a packet to T2. You will not have T1 sending a packet to M1, sending a packet to T2, going to M1, coming to S1, et cetera. It's a much more simpler model of BGP they have picked up for various reasons. And whether those reasons can be relaxed, uh, we can talk about separately. I believe they can be. Uh, but uh, anyway, that's the basic idea of BGP. So we have now another question, which is what network automation tools are you currently using? And you could go ahead and answer that. So we'll, yeah, we'll give you about 30, 20, 15 seconds um, to go ahead and uh, answer your questions. We're curious to know what network automation tools you're using, and then we'll uh, move on. Also, keep your questions coming in, and we'll go ahead and answer them. As we are waiting for the results, I see a question coming in. How do you recommend to populate the routing table using the network command? In case of BGP, if you are at the very edge, you can choose to use redistribute connected, or you can choose to use network commands. In the case of OSPF, I recommend that you not use network commands. And I'll talk about why in a few seconds uh, as we go further down. Though there is nothing that prevents you from using it, it's a perfectly fine way to do it, but what it prevents you from doing is being able to automate very cleanly uh, in a very simple way. And we'll talk about that in a few seconds. So if you use, we use more than one tool, this poll only allows you to choose one. Uh, that's a carry question. We'll have a separate webinar on that. <laughs> so we talked about the configuration and we said, oh, you know, look at the configuration for a eight level node. The configuration looks actually pretty simple. 
that configuration that I showed for M1 is the same for M2 and M3 and M4. It's not very different from what S1 and S2 have. And the top of racks have almost the same configuration, except for, as someone asked the question, how do you populate the information uh, about uh, configuration, which is how do I decide what prefixes are to be announced? So what are the key characteristics of any automatable configuration? The key characteristics of any automatable configuration are that the, it has to be cookie cutter, which means there is as little node-specific variation as possible. That means as little as you have it, nothing more than a single IP address and the host name, for example, nothing more than that. That would be very easy. That would be very useful. The second thing is you duplicate information as little as possible. For example, if you had to specify IP addresses for interfaces in the interface con configuration setup, trying to re repeat that in the OSP of BGP network statement is error prone. Yes, these are scripts and so you can actually make them less error prone than if you're typing them by hand, but it's still something that I avoid, I like to avoid because the less you have information that is node specific, the more easy it is for you to be able to replicate this information across multiple boxes. And finally, even though you can do a lot of configuration, I prefer to do as little as possible, which means that what would be very useful for vendors to do is to be able to set the defaults up or to allow you to be able to specify these defaults such that for your data center you specify them once and you're done and you're not repeating the specification every single time. That will allow you to look at configuration and troubleshoot them very effectively because you're only looking at what is interesting to you and what's required as opposed to all the other pieces which are not interesting. So there is, I have uh, one more question. Uh, will you discuss how low is routing used? Is it at the TOR leaf? So we went over the aspect of the class network and in a class network, layer three begins at the first hop switch. The entire network is layer three. If you are looking for L2 services, the way you would do that in these kinds of configuration is you typically run a network virtualization to get an L2 over L3 service. The advantage of that is essentially agility, the adaptability and flexibility, and also it simplifies your configuration life substantially, but I won't be able to get into all of that right now because we talked about that in the previous webinar. I also see a question that's, again, a product-specific question, and please, if there are product-specific questions, uh, let's take them offline. This is not supposed to be a cumulus Linux pitch. This is supposed to be a routing intro, and I'd like to keep this technical and not delve into product pitches if I can help it. And I also see a question, can you set defaults in cumulus for the Quagga components? Uh, and the answer is yes, uh, we can do uh, defaults, but that's something that's coming up. It's not there right now. So in terms of simplifying configuration, one of the primary things that you can do is with OSPF, something called OSPF unnumbered interfaces. The basic idea in there is that essentially you can run such that every interface does not have to have an IP address. Typically, this was used in the past because what this enabled you to do was to ensure that your, correct, your other end was correctly connected. OSPF would do certain things such as, hey, you know, if the other end is not correctly configured via the same subnet, then the link won't come up. What this leads to actually is that if you are a brand new, if you're a fairly lay person or if you're someone who's very unfamiliar or you're trying to script it and you're, there may be errors in your script, this makes it very easy to have things not work and you be confused as to why it's not working. The fact that they both have to be on the same subnet is something that's not immediately apparent. And this is something that I think actually adds to the complexity of what people perceive routing to be. So my approach would be to say, just get rid of interface specific IP addresses and just go with uh, unnumbered interfaces when it comes to OSPF. And what I'm talking about actually helps in multiple ways. As an operator, you don't have to add additional IP addresses and configure a, an IP address on every link. This simplifies the IP address allocation and this simplifies your interface configuration. And what I'm talking about is not very unusual because IPv6 is already doing this with what it calls the link local address. And it uses, for example, in an IPv6 network, link local addresses are used to routing pretty much everywhere. 
And also the other aspect of this is from security. If you use numbered interfaces and if these advertise, addresses are advertised, then they can become attack vectors from the outside world. And these are reasons why people also try and avoid using link local ad, I mean, uh, global addresses on interfaces. OSPF, like I said, already has a concept called unnumbered interfaces, and you can simplify it. And this simplifies interface configuration, and if not routing configuration, because you already saw the OSPF configuration earlier, it will remain about the same even with unnumbered interfaces. But it does reduce your complexity in the other ways. And as I pointed out, what I'm trying to demonstrate in this is not just that layer 3 or OSPF is easy, but the whole configuration should be as automatable and simplifiable as possible so that you don't have to repeat information that you don't have to or you don't have to configure things that you don't need to. I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first question is, is layer 3 routing based on Zebra? Uh, Quagga is the routing protocol suite. Zebra is the rib part of the routing protocol suite. And so that's, again, a very Quagga-specific question. But yes, that uh, Zebra is not the one that's doing the routing configuration. There, is a, there are separate demons to do OSPF and BGP configuration. Going on, we said, OK, OSPF is simplified. But you talk about BGP, and you say all the large-scale operators uh, work uh, well uh, with uh, BGP. How would you, is BGP actually that much more simpler? Isn't BGP more complicated to automate, etc.? And why is that? The first problem is BGP uses TCP as a transport, which implies the need for an IP address in the specification. That means I have to have a node-specific information in my configuration, which is that. The second is, like I said, it violates the multiple cookie cutter configuration metrics. First of all, the IP address is specified in multiple places. First, it has specified in the IP interface definition. It's specified in your neighbor statement. And all the configuration, as a result, become node specific. It would be good if we can make BGP not be node specific as well. I have a comment which says, oh, you know, if you use unnumbered interfaces, they don't work well with trace route. Uh, they work pretty well with Traceroute, actually, and uh, we know that, and uh, this is a detailed discussion. Maybe this is something that we can take offline, but uh, people who say that Traceroute doesn't work very well are talking about a very specific problem that they have had in the past, which I don't believe uh, applies to many data center networks. So here is what an unnumbered BGP configuration looks like. If you look at the previous and you look at this, this looks identical to what the OSPF has. Instead of IP addresses, you have interfaces. You say neighbor, SWP1, that's the remote AS. Neighbor, SWP2, that's the remote AS. And essentially now you've reduced BGP also to be non-node specific when it comes to you've reduced the amount of information that is node specific. There are no IP addresses in this configuration. And this is something that Cumulus Linux has done as part of the ability to simplify configuration. And this works, it interoperates with any other configuration. It's a configuration simplification that we have done. It is not a protocol change. And how do we play this trick? We essentially use IPv6 router advertisement to determine link local address of the other end. And with that, we set up a session over the link local address. And this works very well for IPv6 today. And for IPv4, the work is in progress. We will have a solution out soon. And again, the model is that it should work in a way that is standard and interoperable with other vendors, not in a way that somehow forces you down a particular path. And so, like I said, this helps you, the previous configuration helps you simplify your configuration so there is less node-specific information. The further simplification that you can make is that in the BGP configuration, there is this remote AS which starts looking very, very node specific again. Hey, if I have to start saying ASN, ASN everywhere, isn't that node specific as well? Yes, you are right, it is. And the answer to that is you can switch to using something called IBGP, which is really BGP, but with the AS numbers kind of ignored. There are other protocol specific details uh, which I won't get into, but in general, it's the same simple engine. And uh, what it reduces you to is you can just have three simple templates. You can have one set of configuration for the leaf, one set of configuration for the spine, the pod level spine, and a separate set of configuration for the interpod level spine. But all the devices that act in that role as a leaf 
as a pod level spine or as an interpod level spine pretty much get the same cookie cutter configuration and what does that look like that looks like the following the configuration looks a little more actually and that's because of the IBGP nature of things but here is where I talk about saying if you can specify all the defaults in a separate place then you can reduce this configuration to something very simple as simple as the EBGP model but essentially this is again reduced to saying that you have SWP1 which is a TOR, SWP2 that is a TOR and if you look at this configuration all the hard-coded numbers are hard-coded they are the same everywhere you just see 65,400 everywhere the only thing that is specific to this node is the router ID that is who am I I got a couple of more questions well the first question is how does a node know the remote IPv6 link local address to be set up for the BGP session so IPv6 has a mechanism called router advertisement and what router advertisement it does is it tells you tells the other end of the link what are all the addresses configured on that interface and using that mechanism we can figure out how to get to the neighbor's IP address and if you have a router advertisement you can use router for example if you are a vendor who does not implement the neighbor interface mechanism you can look at the link local address of the peer using router advertisement and configure that in your IP address configure in your BGP configuration and those link local addresses are typically MAC address based and so they tend to stay constant until unless you're changing the link so it's not something that you have to worry about changing every single hop every single time the device reboots as an example so I have other questions which are actually more detailed um, uh, which is doesn't that require an IGP for next hop reachability there is no IBGP uh, there's no IGP involved whether you use IBGP or EBGP it's running on every hop and you're essentially as you see in this configuration forcing everything to be next hop self and using route reflector client mechanism of IBGP you simplify everything down so that you don't really need any IGP running in this network and the other question I have is so don't I recommend the BGP only solution that Petter discusses no I'm not saying I don't recommend that there are customers who use that and who are pretty happy I'm trying to show how you can reduce node specific configuration even if you're using something like BGP there is a lot of FUD out there in terms of how much more simpler L2 is how much more easier L2 is and L3 is very hard and I'm trying to show how L3 actually makes the whole thing look very much a simple configuration for someone who is running a few nodes for example all the configuration that I've said here is pretty much what you need you don't need anything much more fancy if you're running a medium small data center you're pretty much done you don't have to worry about a lot of other things so I have another question which is does cumulus call this implementation uh, IP fabric yeah I mean it's not cumulus it's anybody who's essentially saying that if you are running a cross network which is running using L3 then it's a distributed IP fabric that's all and I have another question that's come up are you advocating either OSPF or BGP for leaf or spine I think the answer to that is very much dependent on many people's comfort levels some people feel OSPF is what they understand and they go with that some people feel BGP is better and they go with that in my personal opinion if I were to recommend it I might go with BGP in most cases because it actually ends up becoming much simpler uh, compared to OSPF in many ways you don't have to worry about areas you don't have to worry about ABRs and you don't have to worry about stubby links and not stubby links. there are many things that will essentially walk you can walk away from and build pretty large-scale networks that scale fairly well because remember BGP powers the internet so I want to move on at this point to prescriptive topology manager I'll take there's one more question I'll take a look at that question and then I'll uh, get back the question is with fabric overlays isn't it only required for t1 t2 t3 and t4 to be BGP peers that each advertise tenant routes so the model that uh, the that someone the, the question is talking about is in this model do I have to appear does every hop have to peer with everybody or can't the top of racks the t1 through t4 just peer with each other and completely ignore what's in the middle 
The model that we are presenting to build a distributed IP fabric does not rely on that model. It relies on every the interface uh, peering happening on every interface. So this essentially looks like a regular OSPF from that perspective, except that it's not a link state protocol. So it's actually a much simpler uh, configuration, and actually that yields in the end a much simpler topology, a much simpler protocol to debug, and again, remember, all of the stuff that I'm talking about has only one protocol. It's, IBG, it's either BGP or OSPF. Nothing else has been talked about for communicating all the information so far. Yes, and the other question is, assuming that everything here peers with a directly uh, uh, interf connected interface, yes, you're right. And uh, Robert points out, uh, Robert Razuk, who is on the call, uh, hi, Robert, uh, uh, points out that T1 to T4 is an overlay BGP and class is transport BGP, and he is absolutely right about that. Uh, the person who said that why can't T1s peer with T4s uh, is a orthogonal question. That is not a fabric uh, question. With that said, I want to, so the other question that comes up, which is a useful question, is what is the convergence time in a link failure? That's very much dependent on a vendor's implementation. Uh, personally, having worked with Quagga, I know that we have taken BGP configuration down from a public domain version of high numbers to pretty low sub-second numbers. And the same thing applies to OSPF. So you can get sub-second convergence with both BGP and with OSPF for link failures and most of the standard hardware failures. With that said, I want to get into PTM, the Prescriptive Topology Manager. So what is PTM? So one of the things that anybody who looks at a clause understands is that clause is extremely cable heavy. There are a lot of cables crisscrossing. Now, to truth be said, if you're building such a large network, then you will deal with cables. Yeah, that's just an occupational hazard. But when you have got such large cables, a large number of cables, it's very easy to misconfigure and re make cabling errors. As they, so one of the things we want to ensure is cabling correctness in a very simple way. Is that possible? Because this is a problem that we have run into with every single customer, large or small. All the large customers have their own way of mitigating this problem because they have implemented what we are talking about differently. We are bringing the solution to everybody else, so it doesn't matter whether you are a large player or a small player, whether you are a reseller or an integrator, or you are actually a network operator. You want to be able to understand how can I set up networks in a very simple way. And we'll talk about the power of this in the next few slides. So improper cabling errors are, you know, cause reachability issues. They cause unpredictable and low performance. And unfortunately, sometimes you will not be able to detect these errors. People have resorted to in the past using things like numbered interfaces, like I pointed out, so that interfaces are in the same subnet, etc. But to me, that's using a cannonball to kill a mosquito. And there are much simpler tools that you can deploy, such as PTM that you have now, to actually do the right thing. What PTM does is it is very similar. There are, it does very three simple things. It takes, it says, define me the expected topology and use an open source language. It's a graphical language, it's a, it's a language to represent graphs and it's an open source language, it's called DOT. Please define how you expect your physical cabling to be. Next, there's a daemon that runs on every node that takes this network-wide specification and converts that into what is the configuration that I'm actually seeing. And based on that, it, allow, it takes certain actions, and some of those actions can be user-defined as to what is the consequence of a link that is matching, that is, it is the connections are as expected, versus the connections are not as expected. So in this picture, for example, if you look at the uh, illustrative topology that we have, the illustrative topology has the mechanism of being able to map uh, S1 P1, S1 port 1 is mapped to M1 port 3, S1 port 2 is mapped to M2 port 3, et cetera. This is, the, this is as simple as it gets. I mean, if you look at the configuration, there's really nothing that you're specifying. You're using a node specification, and you're using a port specification and showing what is connected to each other. This network-wide file, by the way, this is a network specification of the entire network. It is not something that is node-specific. This is a network-wide specification. 
What you do is you use a to tool such as uh, Chef, CF Engine, Puppet, your own homebrew, Ansible, and you push this out to all the nodes. It's the same file that's pushed out to everybody. It is not a simple, it's not like there's a node specific file like the routing configuration. It is completely the same file. It's in the exact same file to everybody. PTM then chews up this file and then based on the matching design flow, the certain set of actions are taken and not matching, certain set of actions are taken. So as I said, the PTM uses something called LLDP, which is again a very standard protocol that is out there. It's an IEEE standard. You have implementations that run on Linux, therefore they run on Cumulus Linux, but it, they run on all kinds of vendors, whether it be Cisco, Arista, Juniper, all of them run it. And the origins of LLDP lay in, lie in Cisco's original protocol called Cisco Discovery Protocol. And then everybody had a version of it. There was an extreme discovery protocol. There was a not so extreme discovery protocol. So finally, there was a standardized version that, that was called LLDP, which is link level discovery protocol. We use this information to actually be able to communicate, to determine who is at the other end of the link and match the appropriate uh, and ensure that the cabling is done correctly. There's a question about this, which is, are there any modifications done to LLDP for this? Absolutely not. This works with every other vendor's LLDP out there. There are no modifications done to it, either at our end or at their end. This is completely standard specific, standards compliant, and just the standard thing. And also to be clear, PTM does not have to run at both ends. It can run on just one end and the actions taken on one end is sufficient. This is again back to routing. Routing says if I can't hear you, I'm going to assume you're dead. Unlike spanning tree which says if I can't hear you, you must be dying to hear from me. So here are all the packets I'm going to tell you about. So that's the difference. And so LLDP and PTM is done in a very simple way that you can in, again, interoperate without requiring every device in the network to necessarily be running it. Of course, it's better if every device runs it and does its own health monitoring, but it's not mandatory. So this is something that you can uh, add to uh, your networking configuration. PTM comes with certain predefined hookups. It comes with Quagga, so it acts, Quagga can act as a PTM client, and you can see in this picture a mechanism whereby you can see how Quagga configuration, it shows in the green that PTM is passed. And this is a standard, uh, this is something that we have added to Quagga and extended it, but you don't have to do it this way. Unfortunately, we've switched to a very new webinar platform, and I'm not able to figure out how to share my uh, terminals, I actually had a demo set up at the end of this where I would walk you through two different mechanisms and models and the entire workflow of PTM, but maybe that's something that's going to be on a subsequent webinar where we will do a complete hands-on experience with routing configuration, setup, uh, all of that using PTM and without PTM as well. So the, I have a question for PTM to work correctly, should the node ID be correct? Yes, we will have, uh, the node IDs have to be correct. Of course, I have to know who are you. If you misguide me, then I'll have to start doing things like security to verify that you are who you say you are. Otherwise, yes, there is going to be uh, that particular issue. If you say you're Dinesh, you're gonna get technical questions. So coming to PTM, uh, we also have a mechanism to see the status of it. You see PTM CTL, you see, and it gives you the information about whether the check passed or failed, and the output can be displayed in JSON as well, and you can get all kinds of information. And people are asking the question, oh, is PTM something that's specific to Cumulus? It's specific to Cumulus in the sense the it was invented here, uh, and uh, but that said, uh, it is not, uh, uh, PTM is an open source project. We have pu published it under the Eclipse public license, and it's under the Eclipse public license because we are using the dot library parser that uh, Graphviz has put out, and that's the link on GitHub to be able to access it. We recently updated it like a uh, few weeks back with all the latest, and the model is to keep pushing out all the work that we are doing onto the GitHub. So it is something that we expect to be used by a lot of people. For example, one of our customers was telling us that even though they have a layer two network, they use PTM to verify that the server to the access switch connectivity is accurate. If the wrong server is connected to the wrong access switch, they then they shut off the server or prevent the server from communicating.
any further questions i'll wait i have somebody who's actually uh, talking about and saying that hey you know i really like your new webinar platform because i can run it on linux thank you we are glad it is and we will use ready talk for future seminars too i believe we are not planning to switch to the old one but i have to be able to figure out a way to get uh, the displays working i started a little late on that so we will have a demo session uh, in a subsequent webinar where we'll go over actually the hands on i will talk less and show you more and PTM, so PTM, fine cabling check, is there anything more interesting than that? Actually, PTM comes with something that's very interesting, and that is, it is the first thing that gives you a network-wide configuration, which means that one of the fundamental problems that operators face, and in my mind, a key reason why many people genuflect very quickly to a centralized controller model is because they think, hey, I as an operator know how I want my network to work, but now I have to translate this God's eye view of the network into box specific configuration. This mapping of God's eye view to network wide configuration leads to networking problems as it leads to miserable conditions for those of us who believe that the God exists and uh, he's doing all of this to build character. So the same way, there is this whole aspect that it's, something is lost in translation and it is very difficult and that is where a lot of the errors happen that when you map what the network operator knows of the entire network to a box specific configuration, there are problems and that makes it very hard. What I would like to say is having seen the cookie cutter configurations that you've seen and how easy it is to generate, this is not difficult at all. So all you need is the physical cabling plan of the network and a few other attributes to be specified, such as uh, whether it is, uh, you know, you want to use OSPF or BGP, and we can generate all the routing configuration for you for every single node. And this is an example to me of how you can look at a network-wide configuration and map it to node-specific configuration. So we see PTM not just as a mechanism to do cabling correctness, but as a mechanism for us to be able to define what we expect of the network. It's prescriptive topology manager. Maybe we got a little too carried away in forcing topology in there. It's essentially a prescriptive manager. It can ensure that whatever you would like prescriptive can be enforced. So to sum up, Class topology allows for a simplified configuration. Routing configuration can be fairly simple and coupled with ideas like PTM, BGP unnumbered interfaces. Manage L configuring L3 networks is actually a snap and it's actually very, very automatable. And therefore, it can be very simple how you can build a large network or a small network for that matter and actually have it run. We have uh, various uh, uh, resources available. We have also a, something called a Cumulus Workbench, and we have something uh, called a Cumulus uh, Workbench Demos, where you can actually log in and access. And if you go to the support and documentation uh, link on our website, you can get access to this. You can actually go and understand, and you can actually see how Puppet, Chef, Ansible, etc., can be used to deploy networks with all of these routing configurations that we talked about, and that includes monitoring as well. And uh, there's one more. So uh, we're going to go into questions for Dinesh, um, because I think we're just about out of time. Yep, um, I've, but I'm done with my presentation as well. Fantastic. So um, really quick, um, we're going to ask a few questions, and if you could go ahead and if you're interested in the Cumulus Workbench, um, if you can go ahead and check yes or no. So a few questions that came into the audience that um, Dinesh hasn't answered yet. Since BGP is slow to converge, is there another con to using BGP inside the uh, data center um, since you are introducing suboptimal routing and route oscillation? So BGP is not slow to con uh, converge in the data center. I'm aware of many large customers uh, running web scale traffic, traffic that your uh, packets probably flow through every day who are using BGP and they don't have network oscillation. And the ways they work with is essentially 
the model is that they there is no IGP running. The moment you say that I, I have to rely on somebody else to tell me authentically what is to be done, then I have a difficulty. If I don't have somebody else to tell me what needs to be understood, I can actually function pretty well pretty quickly. And so BGP can be made to work fairly rapidly and like I said, achieve pretty sub-second convergence. We have cases where with a large number of peers and uh, with as much as uh, 1,000, 2,000, 10,000 prefixes, uh, which is what is of the norm in the data center, you can get sub-second to a second convergence. Perfect. And another question. What are your thoughts on using more centralized control architecture, SDN controller with EG, or for example, OpenFlow, um, instead of dis distributed routing to accomplish all of this? So that's a webinar in itself, uh, I believe. And so rather than answer that very broadly, I hope that I have shown you that you can build a distributed fabric that to use motherhood and apple pie like statements we are stronger because we work together rather than i am a strong individual and if you think about it networks work because things are designed such that things can fail and life will still go on and having a distributed model at least for the underlying infrastructure helps in a particular way but you know we can get into a lot of details on that later and one more, or actually we have a few more. Have you thought about offloading BGP from the switches using some SDN southbound protocol? We're working on something like that currently. Uh, there are lots of people who have said, all I can do is just you know, com communicate with the BGP, and I can use BGP as my SDN controller, so to speak. Um, Petr Lopukov, again, has a paper out uh, which came out in Nanog called Brain Slug, and you can go look it up if you want. And there are various ways you can play all those games, but though, now you're getting to be sophisticated. And uh, this seminar was just about making sure that people don't uh, – get terrified of L3 and they understand that L3 is actually much more automatable than L2 is. Will using BGP inside the data center open up security vulnerabilities such as black hole and delay? Well, I can turn around and say, will using OSPF inside the data center create black holes and delay? People don't ask that question of spanning tree. It's melted enough networks, I believe, to make a nice grilled cheese sandwich. But hey, you know what? It's uh, still used, so I'm not worried about that. Are there any open source tools that you know about that can help in fabric visibility and troubleshooting when doing network virtualization? Some vendors claim their proprietary fabric is the best to provide uh, telemetry to simplify network operations. And the answer to the question is if uh, the source of my money relies on my not being able to understand something, then you can be assured that I will not understand it. Do you believe in a proprietary fabric? I believe the answer has been made in the server industry already. Proprietary answers such as SDI, Solaris, all of them are gone. People rely on, people build networks to allow their applications to work well. You focus on the applications, the networks provide the connectivity substrate. Their job is to ensure that people can talk to each other and they can continue to talk to each other effectively without relying on complicated schemes. In its best guise, the network is like a manager. It's invisible. When it's working, nobody is aware that it's there. That's how networks ought to be. And in my mind, you know, Cumulus is based on a premise which is the best brains in the world are not all inside a single company. And we believe in collaborative effort, and which is why all of the tools that we are working on, all of the enhancements we are doing to Quagga, we are pushing it back into open source. Because we believe that these problems help when we can all work collaboratively together. So do I believe in a proprietary fabric being better? I don't. Thank you, Dinesh. Thank you, everyone. We are out of time. Um, we. We do have a lot of extra questions that, that came in. Um, we'll have them posted on our blog later. Um, we have another webinar in the next few weeks. Uh, it's October 1st, and it's to extend your automation from DevOps to NetOps. So we hope you join us there. You can find all the information on cumulusnetworks.com slash webinars. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Dinesh. And uh, one last thing, please, uh, if you believe that you want a hands-on demo, please uh, Send a, drop a comment in the thing so people will know that that's something that we want to have a follow-up on. Thank you.